Um, but I want, I want to start by thanking uh, Joan for the incredible work she's done here at Harvard Medical School, um, leading this effort over a mere 25 years and inspiring uh, many uh, faculty members to learn more about diversity and also uh, helping advance the, uh, the careers of uh, innumerable uh, faculty members as well. I had the uh, pleasure of participating in an event and a program that Joan also uh, uh, pursues outside of Harvard Medical School, the Biomedical Sciences Career Program, which has touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of underrepresented minority uh, students in this area, helping to, or trying to inspire them to go into careers in, uh, in medicine. So, uh, so Joan is uh, one of my heroes uh, in, in the world and, and one of the great treasures of Harvard Medical School and academic medicine. So Joan, thank you for everything that you do. something relatively unusual in academic medicine these days, and that is to give a talk without any slides. And I'm going to speak both from my uh, head uh, as well as from my heart about an important uh, topic. And the, uh, the title of my talk is Toward a, Month, more, a More Just Society in Healthcare, the Role of Academic uh, Medical Centers. Um, I thought I would start by telling a personal uh, story, which may help you understand why I'm quite passionate about this, uh, this topic. Um, I am, uh, my, my family uh, is originally from Eastern Europe, from Lithuania in particular, and as uh, Jews in Lithuania in the early part of the last century, uh, faced quite a bit of uh, persecution uh, from the local uh, population. In an act of incredible uh, heroism, my family decided to uh, uh, take a boat <laughs> across the Atlantic here to the United States and uh, settled in the city of uh, Baldwin. My, uh, great grandfather and great grandmother hoping to find a uh, better life for them and for their children. Uh, shortly after getting here to um, to Boston, my great grandfather um, was involved in an accident and developed uh, tibial osteomyelitis. This was around 1910, and back in 1910, uh, there were no uh, antibiotics available. Uh, uh, the notion of treating a septic shock was uh, unthinkable. Uh, and so, I guess somehow the family did some research as to where the best treatment was for infected legs. And uh, my great-grandfather uh, wound up at, in the surgical clinic at Mass General Hospital, where for every week for 10 years, he got his leg um, uh, wrapped with uh, this very high-tech uh, solution, a dressing called Dakin's solution, which I've come to learn is nothing more than dilute bleach. But for 10 years, he would come by streetcar from Alden to MGH, get his leg treated. He was accompanied by his teenage daughter, who turned out to be my uh, grandmother. And, um, and ever, ever, well, I never met my great-grandfather, named for him, but, um, but heard from my grandmother over the years growing up in Malden how uh, incredibly nice the people were at Mass General, how smart they were, and how grateful the family was for the care, in part because he was, they were, the family was very poor, he didn't have the means to pay for his care, and so all the care that he received over that 10-year period uh, in an effort to save his leg was, uh, was free. Um, what I also learned uh, subsequently, however, was that if my grandmother or one of her brothers and sisters had wanted to train at Mass General Hospital in the 19, 1910, 1920, that wouldn't have been possible because Mass General, uh, the Peter Van Brigham Hospital, most of the hospitals here in town, uh, did, would not accept uh, Jewish uh, trainees. Uh, that's why the Beth Israel Hospital and Jewish hospitals and other communities in this country were created as places that would train uh, Jewish uh, trainees. So fast forward to 1983, when I did my first rotation at, uh, at MGH, um, I was uh, struck uh, immediately by some of the same qualities I heard from my grandmother, namely that the people were really nice, they were really focused on taking great care of patients, and um, and they were also pretty uh, smart uh, as well. And, and I fell in love with that uh, culture and maybe one of the most important parts of my um, responsibilities as president of the MJH is to try to strengthen and sustain uh, that culture going forward. But I also noticed that um, the members of the faculty at that point were Jewish and some of the house staff did not feel uh, comfortable openly talking about their religion. And, and actually so we're, went out of their way to avoid talking about their religion. Even though Mass General between 1910 and 1980s, uh, I think it was around 1950, started accepting Jewish physicians, it was still not a very warm and 
fuzzy place for uh, Jewish physicians to train. The motto among us at that time was uh, look British, think Yiddish, uh, <laughs> which I thought was a uh, humorous way to, uh, to deal with the situation. But I'm pleased to say that that situation has gotten a lot uh, better as the hospital has become much more diverse and I think more inclusive of people of, of my religion and hopefully other groups uh, as well. Um, so from my um, personal experience, my people of my religion's experience, but also my family and my own personal experience, uh, the issue of social justice is something that I care uh, very, very deeply about. Um, but you may ask, why, why should an academic medical center uh, care about diversity, inclusion, community health uh, issues, dealing with the social determinants of health? And, and it seems to me, as I was thinking about this talk, that there are at least uh, four reasons why we should care deeply about these issues. One is, is because social justice, oops, for me, social justice is enough to want to focus on uh, issues of diversity and and community health, uh, but for some piece, people it's not uh, enough. Another important reason why we need to do this is because of, and this is more of a business reason, is because of the changing, changing demographics of our society and the fact that unless we have a workforce that is reflective of the changing demographics of our society, um, we're, we're going to put ourselves at risk for uh, the, uh, very, the, the changing demographics and the fact that um, uh, a lot of people in our society are not going to feel uh, interested or comfortable uh, receiving care in our institutions unless our uh, staff are reflective of them. Third reason I, I think where there's growing evidence is that it's quite clear from some work done in economics and other social sciences that the more diverse a group of people you have trying to solve a problem, the better you do at solving uh, that problem. And so I think there's a strong connection that can be made between diversity uh, and inclusion and equality, uh, and so I think if you want to be a better uh, institution, uh, then you need to uh, focus on diversity. Um, and the last issue is that we are, uh, we, namely academic medical centers, the vast majority of whom are uh, non-profit charitable institutions created by society to improve public health. If we want to improve public health, and we realize that only 20% of public health is the result of medical care, and the other 80% is the result of the social and economic determinants of health, how could we not focus on that other 80%? Uh, percent? Uh, so some of you may know, uh, I uh, last year stepped down as chair of the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, and one of the privileges uh, associated with that uh, role is, uh, is being in a position at the end of your chairmanship to give a talk to 3,000 people uh, from around uh, the country um, many leaders in academic medicine. Uh, as that uh, talk was approaching and I was struggling to think of what I should talk about, um, I re realized that the talk was being held in Baltimore about nine months after Freddie Gray died after being arrested by the Baltimore police. And given everything that was happening in our country uh, long before this election, uh, even this election cycle, uh, it seemed uh, appropriate that um, this topic of social justice and what academic medical centers uh, could do about it uh, was the, the theme of my, my remarks. Um, I, I believe that academic medical centers in general uh, take much too narrow approach to this uh, topic, um, particularly when it comes to community health, do as little as they can get away with uh, in the court of public opinion. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that's uh, 180 degrees different from the approach that we're uh, taking at, uh, at Mass General. Uh, a lot of academic medical centers uh, don't think about uh, the issues that caused uh, Freddie Gray's death uh, until he shows up uh, in their emergency room, which is uh, far too late to be able to intervene in the uh, social determinants of health that caused his, uh, his death. So uh, I don't believe that we in, in our society and in, including academic medicine can be take a blind, turn a blind eye to the fact that the root causes of unrest in our uh, country and there are the same things that are the root causes of inequities in healthcare. Unfortunately in our country we have a long legacy of discrimination which has led to substandard housing, uh, poverty, uh, segregation, neighborhoods plagued by drugs and violence, uh, vast uh, income uh, gaps, 
and lack of access to good education, health care, and nutrition for uh, subsets of our uh, society, all uh, social determinants of health. Uh, some of the most interesting social science that I've seen recently actually has come from a former employee of MGA, somebody who used to run our admitting department, who is now quite a prominent professor at Yale University. Her name is Betsy Bradley. Uh, the United States, she has looked at international comparisons of uh, government spending on various issues. Um, and as you all know, healthcare spending in this country is much higher than any other country in the world. But if you look at social, if you add together healthcare spending and social spending here in the U.S. and, and compare us to other countries, particularly in Western, in, in Europe, the total is almost identical. Um, in in Europe, countries spend much more on social issues than we do, and put up with much less poverty, violence, uh, etc. We spend much more on healthcare. And, and I would argue that those other countries are making much wider, wiser choices, cho choices uh, addressing social problems so, and, um, and making their societies healthier and thereby taking some of the burden off of the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, so I think that that work of Betsy's is, is quite uh, interesting and I think insightful. Um, so it, it seems to me that there are at least three things that academic medical centers can do to uh, to advance social justice, diversity, inclusion, community health, and I know I'm lumping a bunch of things together. Um, but the first is, and, and these things that I'm going to mention are in concentric cir circles of influence. The things that we have direct control over are our clinical research, education, and community missions, the things that we could do interior to those missions and how we manage our overall uh, enterprise uh, that I think can help. Um, the next layer, the next concentric circle, is us as corporate citizens and what some are increasingly referring to as anchor institutions within our community and how we as large employers, purchases or supplies, etc., uh, investors can, can make a real difference in the community if we turn our attention to it. Uh, and then the third layer that I would, uh, I think is also important, but the one we have the least influence over is advocacy. And, uh, and advocating for um, issues beyond our narrow self-interest. So I'm going to start with the first uh, circle, the, the one uh, right, right in the middle. And I wanted to start with a quote that I didn't uh, know about from Dr. Martin Luther King until uh, pretty uh, recently. He apparently gave what was a, a, gave a speech to an organization called the Medical Committee for Human Rights in 1966. There's no transcript of the speech, no video or audio recording of it, but several people who attended the speech quoted him uh, saying the following words. He said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So that's uh, pretty profound uh, to think about. Uh, and it is uh, stunning to me, shocking, disappointing, that uh, in 2016, 50 years after passage of the Civil Rights Act that um, the single strongest predictor of someone's health status in this country is the color of that person's uh, skin. Um, you're all familiar with the IOM uh, report on quality that was done a number of years ago in which the IOM I think did a great job identifying six pillars of quality, patient-centeredness, efficiency, etc. I think that most, most healthcare organizations have completely forgotten the sixth pillar, which is equity. And, and I don't believe that you can really have a quality in healthcare unless you address inequality uh, in healthcare. Uh, and so I think it's, it's really important that healthcare institutions and their clinical activities really focus on equity with the same uh, vigor that they focus on the other pillars of, of the IOM. Most uh, academic medical centers have pretty robust uh, quality uh, infrastructures, but only a small percentage of it, if any, is directed toward uh, addressing issues of equity. I, I think a lot of places are afraid to look there, and a lot of places don't know how to look there, and I suspect there's some places that don't want uh, to look there. Um, we at, at the MGH over the last 10 years have, have looked there with this uh, quite a bit of uh, energy we created about 10 years ago part of our organization called the Disparity Solutions Center, led by Dr. Joe Bettencourt. 
It has not only helped advise other organizations about how to address issues of disparities, but it has led our own internal efforts to address issues of disparities. We try to uh, take all of our quality data and stratify it by race and ethnicity. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with our the people who register our patients to make sure that we are getting capturing good data about their race, ethnicity, uh, sexual preference, uh, et, et cetera. And that enables us to do that uh, stratification. We um, uh, constantly mine that data, looking for evidence of disparities. I'm pleased to say that in most areas that we look, the vast majority of areas, we can't find any. But we do, when we do find some, um, we do something about it. We take that data and we put it on our uh, website. And we do that because we think that holds us uh, accountable uh, in a public way for, uh, for these uh, issues like we, like we should be accountable. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, Brandeis uh, sunlight uh, is the best uh, disinfectant. Um, we have found a couple of disparities um, in, in the course of this data mining. One looking, for example, at diabetes screening among our Latino patients, and another at uh, colon cancer screening among our minority uh, patients. Um, and we, when we found that disparity, we didn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what was causing it. As you know, the causes of disparities are complicated. Uh, there are many, many of them. We just uh, rolled up our sleeves to try to uh, figure out what we could do to fix them. And we decided to take um, this same approach uh, to addressing this issue that is used to manage congestive heart patient, failure patients and try to prevent readmissions. We applied sort of the science of disease management uh, for our diabetic patients, uh, higher diabetes coaches uh, reached out to our, uh, in that case, Latino patients. Uh, and, and I won't go into the details of the programs that we've put in place when we've identified disparities, but I'm very pleased to say that over the course of a couple of years, we've been able to reduce them dramatically and in some cases uh, eliminate them, which we're very uh, proud of. We also uh, believe uh, that one of the important causes of disparities are unconscious bias, and we are uh, doing quite a bit of training of, about unconscious bias across the organization, including exposing people to implicit association tests, which if you haven't taken one, I encourage you to do. Uh, it was, it's a shocking experience to, uh, to, to go through. Uh, we uh, have all of our search committees, search committees for our new chiefs of service, go through that kind of uh, training uh, so that we are, um, have our um, eyes wide open and, uh, and are trying and doing our best to enhance the diversity of our institution including our leadership. Somebody brought to, recently brought to my attention a study that came out of the University of Virginia and was recently published in the proceedings of the uh, NAS, which I think just highlights the importance of um, bias among physicians and trainees in the care of patients. Uh, these investigators asked 222 white medical students and residents to uh, classify 15 statements about uh, patients uh, as to whether they were definitely, probably, or possibly true or untrue, and these um, uh, and, uh, and and these were statements about black uh, patients. Four of the statements that the uh, these uh, subjects received were true; the other eleven were not true. And uh, and remarkably, fifty percent of the medical students and residents thought that at least one of the false statements was true, including forty percent of first and second year medical students and 25% of residents who thought that blacks had thicker skin than white patients, 14% of second year medical students said blacks had less sensitive ner nerve endings than white patients, and 12% of third year medical students uh, thought that blacks age more slowly than white uh, patients. Um, in, in the same study, the case studies were presented, uh, identical case studies, except that the patients were, some patients were white, some patients were black, and what was remarkable was that white medical students and residents rated the pain of black patients as less severe and were less likely to prescribe painkillers, which is exactly as what, ha what happens in emergency rooms across this country. Um, so it is quite clear that people who come into medicine, people who are in medicine, have these unconscious biases that influence their uh, judgments about patients. Uh, not in, they don't, they're not trying to do it in a malicious way, but unless we expose those biases to those individuals, uh, I think there's, um, we're not going to make as much progress in addressing disparities uh, than otherwise. Um, 
I also think that uh, in addition to focusing on our clinical care, we also need to uh, focus on our community. Uh, we at MGH, unlike most academic medical centers, always talk about having four missions, not three. The fourth, and in some ways, in our case, the first, being community health. Um, we uh, work very closely with some of the poorest communities in this uh, region, Chelsea, Revere, uh, part of Boston, the community of uh, this uh, part of Boston called Charlestown. And, uh, and we work with community leaders, a variety of community organizations, to figure out how, what are their most important healthcare priorities and how can we uh, help. In recent years, each of the communities has, well, in past years, each of the communities identified different issues from um, alcohol among teenagers to viol uh, violence uh, as, as their top issues. But what's been remarkable in the last few years is that all of the communities have identified substance use disorders, particularly opiates, as overwhelmingly their top priority. We went through a strategic planning process at MGH over the last several years, and I was very proud of the fact that the single initiative that got the most support and we've invested the most in coming out of that strategic plan was a comprehensive program focused on substance use disorders among our patients. I think it was really the first time in our history where a community health need drove our clinical uh, agenda. So in the past, if you were a patient who came into Mass General with a uh, heroin overdose, you would either get stabilized in our emergency room or in our intensive care unit, and you were told uh, once you recovered not to do that again and sent uh, home, which is probably how it happens in most hospitals around this country. It's a little bit like treating, taking somebody who's just recovered from uh, diabetic ketoacidosis and telling them to watch their diet, not giving them any insulin, and sending them home uh, without any uh, treatment. It's quite clear that it takes months, if not years, for people's brains with substance use disorders to return to normal and for them to be able uh, voluntarily to uh, uh, not, no longer uh, abuse those uh, substances or use those substances. And so the way that we're treating people in most hospitals in this country doesn't make uh, any medical sense uh, at all. Uh, bail people out of uh, trouble in our emergency room and in our um, intensive care units. But that's just the beginning of the process. We now have a very active uh, addiction consult team that is available to all of our clinicians and, and is caring for dozens of patients at any moment in time. We've established a bridge clinic so that when patients are discharged from the hospital and before they're plugged into what's necessary community resources, they're seen in a, in a bridge clinic at, at the hospital so that we can keep a close eye on them. At this point, we've hired about six um, recovery coaches, former users uh, from the community who are just thrilled to be able to be, now be employees of the hospital. One of them actually was arrested for shoplifting from the hospital about a decade ago, is now one of our employees, and, uh, and they work uh, with these patients uh, on a continuous basis to, uh, to help them, particularly when they're getting into trouble. So we're, we've put in place a disease management program for substance use disorders and, and are treating many more patients with um, Suboxone than was otherwise the case. We've trained a lot of our clinicians about how to administer it. Uh, the treatment for uh, substance use disorders for opiate addiction is about as effective as the treatment for high blood pressure. I don't think many people are as aware of, are aware of that. And we are also, uh, under the leadership of our physicians organization, taking a really, really hard look at our prescribing patterns, which clearly, for many patients, is the first domino that gets them onto this slippery slope leading to heroin addiction. It's shocking to me that in this, in this commonwealth of Massachusetts, opiate uh, prescriptions have gone up five-fold in the last decade uh, as we've tried to aggressively treat pain, pain but have obviously as a profession overshot on that uh, front. So there's a lot to be done in the community. We can, as academic medical centers, team up with uh, various community organizations with coalitions to address uh, community health needs. And, and I think, again, if we want to uh, address uh, the healthcare institutions and really improve health, many ways we can have more of an impact through uh, that one of our missions than our clinical mission. Um, the other thing that we can do within our control is, um, uh, is address equity and employment. Um, I mentioned earlier that our society is becoming much more diverse, but unfortunately our medical school classes and medical school faculty are, are not. In fact, uh, the number and percentage of medical students and uh, underrepresented minority medical students and faculty has remained unchanged over the last 20 years across this country, even though um, 
our population has become much, much more diverse. Um, I, I've been sitting for the last uh, eight years on the AAMC board. We're the ones who administer the MCAT. There has been a huge amount of looking at the MCAT as a possible uh, barrier to uh, getting people into, uh, uh, into medical careers. It is quite clear that if you look at the percentage of um, white students who take the MCAT to apply to medical school, it is significantly higher than the number of uh, African-American students, and, uh, and that is unfortunate that a test would discourage uh, so many qualified people from, uh, from going into to medicine. So I think there's a lot more work that can be done on the MCAT, on the uh, national boards, um, on focus on G, uh, grade point averages, and, and we need in our um, admission decisions, both for medical school and residency, uh, as well as our uh, hiring decisions for faculty, um, to look, uh, do holistic re reviews, look at the entire person, including how far they've come, what their resilience is, as opposed to some of these numeric um, uh, crutches that we all too often fall, fall back on. So there's lots of uh, room to make further progress uh, there. Just want to say a word or two about those other two concentric circles, the other, second one being us as anchor institutions. At MGH, we employ 25,000 people, we, our operating budget is about $4 billion. Uh, we need to uh, pay even more attention to where we're purchasing services from and do a better job supporting um, small employers in this uh, region. We need to pay much more attention to where we invest our endowment and our, uh, all of our resources. We need to uh, spend, I think, invest more of it in local real estate. We need to invest more of it in local banks uh, and other uh, firms. Uh, so there's a lot that we can do with the resources that are flowing through us and in our savings accounts to, uh, to su better support our community as, uh, as anchors, not to mention uh, hiring people from our communities uh, as well. And then the final con concentric circle that I mentioned is advocacy. If you look at the advocacy agenda of the AAMC and most teaching hospital, it focuses on Medicare reimbursement, Medicaid reimbursement, uh, NIH funding, all the things that are important but are in our narrow self-interest. I hope in the coming years that we focus a significant amount of energy on things like gun violence, poverty, environmental issues. Uh, again, those are the issues that have a much bigger impact on public health than the, uh, the medical care that we deliver. And it seems to me as healthcare institutions, we should be weighing in on those uh, topics as um, as, as vigorously as we possibly can. Now, I know there are some people, some institutions who are fearful that if we do that and maybe we side more with one party than another, that will jeopardize our narrow interest in the Medicare program and the NIH, but I, I believe that um, we, we can't let those fears interf interfere with us trying to do the right thing, and, uh, and it's my, I, I, I'm intent on uh, Mass General broadening its uh, advocacy agenda, and I hope other uh, academic medical centers uh, will do the same. So uh, I, I want to uh, leave a little bit of time for, more than a little bit of time for any questions that you might have, but I just want to say that, um, uh, that this is an issue that's very important to me. Uh, I hope uh, it's an issue that's become very important to others at, at Mass General Hospital. We're working hard in a number of ways to try to bend the arc of history uh, toward uh, social justice, and as I said, we're doing it uh, because we think it's the right thing to do, because we think given why we were created and what we're supposed to do as a charitable organization, we have a responsibility uh, to pursue this agenda. And, and as I also indicated, I think from a business uh, standpoint, if we don't do it, we're putting uh, the institution in a great degree of peril. So, uh, so I want to thank you for your attention, and like I said, I would be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have.